I mean, so I live, I live almost in Ann Arbor, so it's like a 15 minute drive. So, uh, like everyone around me, most people are Michigan fans. So, uh, it, like everyone was excited to see me and get like my hometown offer. And uh, I was excited too. I've been talking to them for a long time. Um, I have a pretty good connection with them. I've been waiting on it for a while. So I was really excited. All right. <clears throat> Guess that's not coming. Hey, uh, welcome in afternoon live. It is Dennis Fithian and Jim Scarcelli. We're ready to go here. That right there was Cole Cabana. He is uh, five star, uh, sorry, four star running back. Boy, that music's playing in the background there, Scar. One second. There it is. I don't know, it wasn't coming in very good for me. Uh, it was um, Cole Cabana, four star running back, uh, right uh, in my neck of the woods here. Dexter, Michigan. Uh, Scar, how are you? I'm good. Life is good. The Wolverines coming off a win on the hard on the hard floor, and uh, recruiting is good. And uh, yeah, this kid's a good player, man. I seen some film of him. Yeah, uh, let's. You know, I I I told you what we're going to talk about. You can see it in the description. You know, if you're looking on YouTube, but you know, just a little while ago, the the Michigan football Twitter account sent out a picture of a Michigan football helmet, and they said, "Go blue." Something or nothing. What do you think, Jim? Wow, that's the uh, that's the marketing ploy. That's the uh, the message they're sending out. Something or nothing. No, 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 that's what I'm asking you. I mean, they could have just been saying randomly here on a Thursday, "Go blue, let's go." You know, and you can say "Go blue" anytime, but you know, also there, there's a lot of people, as you know, which we're going to talk about here coming up, that are on pins and needles when it comes down to uh to jim harbaugh so you know maybe they're just playing the game maybe they're just having fun maybe they didn't think about that at all maybe there is something behind it so yeah you know, I, I don't know it's a it's a total guess just like you know jim harbaugh and what what he's gonna do it's it's a lot of guessing there so you know maybe everybody's just having a lot of fun yeah i it's been it's been dragging on for a while and i uh but i just think the hiring, hiring of mike elston is big and um because I don't think he, a coach is going to be coming in for a guy who's leaving. I, I, I just think it's uh, they're, they're I think they're coming real close to making the announcement. I think Ward and in and, and, and the agents and the uh, the nil and all this stuff. I think there's a lot of things going on that I, I wish we were privy to, but we're not. And uh, the, the discussions are going on, and I think they're all heading in a positive direction. I think Michigan is going to have their coach. I think we're going to have uh, assistant coaches, uh, more money for assistant coaches so we continue, can continue to bring in the best assistants. And I think we're going to have a mill package, and that whole thing will be solid, and we'll be able to compete against anybody in the country. So that's what I believe is happening behind the scenes. I think we're going to hear some good news pretty soon. You remember you heard that here first, Big D, from Big Scar. I, I got you down. Everybody's uh, listening to you here at 104 on uh, Thursday, the 20th. Well, you mentioned Mike Elston. You know, he he played at Michigan. Uh, he was a lineman. Uh, he was done in 96, and then he stayed around in 97 as a, a student assistant, and then he was uh, in 98 an intern, and then in 99 he was a GA. So he really, uh, you know, paid the price there as um, – you know, being on the staff. And, and then he went to EMU for a couple of years before he linked up a few years later with Brian Kelly at Central, followed him down the Central, then the South Bend, and now he's back to Ann Arbor. So he's, uh, you know, catching on there at BK was a, was a nice career move for, uh, for Coach Elston. I remember him as a player. We played the same position. He was a big outside linebacker, had a good career, played on some good teams. He, he got to play for Coach Mo and for Coach Carr. So he got to see uh, different styles there. But he was a good player, and then you know he, he he got into coaching. But he was he was he had different jobs. He he was at Michigan four years as a, you know, because you could only be a grad assistant. I think two years at that time. It still may only be two or three. But they had different roles for him. You know, he was in video. He was in different different areas. So both Mo and Lloyd must have liked him. They saw he wanted to be. You know, they wanted him a, a part of it. Uh, learn to be a coach. But the guy developed. And uh, did four good years at Michigan, went to Eastern, like you said. I remember dealing with him at the camp, at the Michigan camp for many years. 
and he was like a golfer, you know, he was, but it, that's what GAs do, man. And, and I remember him working with Lloyd and, and Brady when those guys were running the camp and Elston was like, go get this, Mike, go get that. He was, you know, he was like, he was a, he was a golfer, but that's how you start out in coaching, man. You know, you got to pay your dues, but, and then he, you know, he went to sit us. Uh, yeah, you're right. He got hooked up with Kelly central Michigan, went with them to Cincinnati and, and, and they always won, went to Notre Dame and won. So he's uh Mike is a really personable guy. I just talked to a buddy of mine who uh, met him at the high school clinic up in Lansing this past uh, past weekend, and they said Mike Ellison was outstanding, talking to everybody, friendly as hell. He'll be able to recruit. You know, it's a different approach than Nua. You know, Ellison will appeal to some kids maybe differently than Nua, but it's it's not hard selling Michigan, man. But uh, Ellison will definitely have a huge, uh, you know, he's been one of the, he was always a big recruiting guy for Kelly. Like uh, he was like the recruiting coordinator slash D line coach or whatever it was. But I know recruiting was always a big, uh, a, a big part of his heading a, a everywhere he's been. But, um, you know, I, I, it would be like, you know, you, you say selling Michigan's easy. It, it, it's one of these things where, you know, if he goes down to Texas, which I think, I think he did, you know, there's a, there's a, a recruit that uh, vaulted Michigan into this top five, you know, a defensive end and, you know what happened last year with uh, with Hutchinson and Ajabo? You know, I, I would be calling all the top defensive ends and outside linebackers as well, and said, "Hey, you know, you want to come and uh, we got a spot here. You know, you want to be a, a top ten pick in the NFL draft." But you know, Elston walks in a room, and, and you know, anybody says, "Well, what's up with Michigan?" It's pretty easy for him to start talking about Michigan when you play at Michigan, and you know, uh, and anybody that uh, you know, whenever you graduate there, as soon as you know, it, it was ninety six. Well, 95 and 96 were two of the greatest Michigan wins against Ohio State. We know how everybody, uh, you know, what enthusiasm and energy it brought this year for a win. Uh, you know, 95 and 96, Michigan had four losses in those years. But, you know, it's remembered for, you know, Bianca Batuka, 313 yards. And then going down the next year in 96 and, you know, uh, Ty Streets, you know, taking one. Sean Spring slipped and, you know, Michigan held the Buckeyes, the uh, number one team, I think, in the country, you know, to single digits. So, I mean, you always had that. Pretty easy for Elston to go in and, you know, start talking about Michigan. Yeah, you know, you, you know, Danny, I'm, I'm putting myself back as that high school kid getting recruited. And and, and look, there's there's a hundred things you're going to evaluate as a recruit looking at a different school. But I do know I got recruited by some guys. I remember the guy at Michigan State. He played there, and he was the guy that was recruiting me. And those things matter. It matters. It's a small it's a small deal. But Mike Ellison will be able to sit in that living room. And say, look, I know about Michigan. I know how it's a lifelong commitment, and it's you know he he can sell it because he he's lived it, and and it matters, man. And you know the the, the question I want to know, and I I don't even know the answer to this. I think I think this the, who, who does Mike McDonald coach the outside guys, Denny? I don't know the answer to that question. Ajabo Hutchinson, the outside linebackers, and did Sean Nua just coach the two inside guys? I don't know if Mike Ellison is going to have all four, but I thought I had heard McDonald say that he was working with the outside guys. I don't know. I wish I knew the answer to that, but because I know Mike Ellison played outside linebacker and he's coached primarily the uh, D line everywhere he's been. I think he's got some, I think he had coached inside linebackers in the past too, but um, I, look, I, I want great technique. Like we've been, like we did this year. That's what I want from our D line. Because our it, we talked about it every darn game that it always started with the inside two guys Hinton and uh, and and Mozzie Smith. So I, what I want from this guy more than anything is that they continue to coach great technique for our inside down uh, big fellas on defense. That's what I want more than anything. Yeah, you know it's a good point. You know George Hilo is the linebacker coach. Maybe he just coaches the inside guys and the outside guys. Uh, you know are. A separate entity or you know somebody picks up that responsibility and you know uh you know they could also split that up now you know if elston's like uh you know if that was his forte and uh you know they they could uh you know mix those assignments up that's a pretty good question you know next time it comes around for harbaugh you know or if uh you know elston makes himself available you know to ask that particular question just how those responsibilities are divvied up good one scar you know because denny because they're you know and i know as a coach in practice you know the the things that the two inside guys are doing in practice are going to be a lot different than the outside guys you know the outside guys are, are going to have some pass drop responsibilities coverage technique things that these guys aren't going to do in practice so 
I, I'm pretty sure it's McDonald that works that worked with Hutchins. I, I don't know, but yeah, we, I'd like to find out the answer to that question. I'm happy with the decision. He's a, he can. I think he'll be able to recruit really good. And I think I, I watching uh, Notre Dame's D line. They've always played with uh, great effort, great technique. So I, I think we uh, we hit a home run there. Another Michigan guy on the staff. All that stuff helps recruiting. When a kid comes to Michigan on a recruiting visit, man, he's gonna he's gonna get hit in the face with former players everywhere, and they're all gonna have every one of them will have a Big Ten championship ring on their finger. Every single one of them. Well, you think about prior to last year, there was no besides Harbaugh, there was no Michigan man on the staff. Now, you know the uh, the, the staff is littered with one. You know, as as you're talking about uh, Hutchinson and Ajabo, it's pretty interesting because you know you. You do this with new hires. You're like, oh well, look at some of you know Pruitt. There's been some defensive uh, linemen that have gone through Notre Dame, and you say, oh well, Alston had this guy, this guy, this guy. You think about draft picks and you know, or how they fared in the NFL. You know, that comes back on your position coach, goes all the way up to the head coach as well. But you know, who gets credit this year is, is Sean Newa saying, yeah, I mean, like I'm sure coming in at USC, and, and they're like, yeah, I mean, he's. He was the defensive line coach, and and uh, and Aiden Hutchinson and and David Ajabo Hutchinson, you know, might be the first pick in the draft, and Ajabo might be uh, in the top ten. You know, that's a nice, uh, you know, that's a nice bullet point to have on your resume. It certainly sounds good, you know, if you're coming in, and then uh, you know, whoever got credit, you know, I know yeah. McDonald was the overall defensive coordinator, but it's interesting, just you know, where the responsibilities yeah. are. Yeah, yeah. 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 Hope, hopefully, someone. Well, listen to us and ask that question. But I'm like, I like the decision. I'm fired up. Well, good stuff. Uh, you know, I, sometimes we're burying the lead when it comes down to Jim Harbaugh. Uh, as you take Michigan fans or, or college football fans as a whole, they're tuning in. It's like, why are you guys talking about Harbaugh? I mean, everybody's going crazy. Well, I mean, this is day 17, 18, 19 here. Of this is it. Uh, it goes on. You you stated your opinion that you think this is just. Uh, uh, a matter of time before he's, uh, you know, comes back home or makes it official. I mean, he's here. Uh, he doesn't really have to say is, you know, waiting for the announcement on the new contract or whatever, or, you know, he's just, uh, you know, like in coming to America, you know, they always said, uh, you know, Eddie Murphy was just going over to uh, New York to, to store his Royal Oats. I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, Harbaugh might be just, you know, just kicking the tires, just getting, having a little entertainment. Let's see what's going on here. Let's just listen to see what people have to say. I mean, anybody's, uh, you know, theory is as good as the next person's uh, almost here. But, you know, one thing when it comes down to the Raiders and, you know, and, and Mark Davis, they had John Gruden that they gave $100 million to, and he had Mike Mayock as his general manager. But, you know, the, the thought there was that Gruden was also going to have some say on personnel. And I, I don't know if it's a 100% true, but uh, there was um, – uh, the line of thinking that when it came down to the first pick or second pick that, that Gruden was heavily involved. And then later on, it was Mayock making the selection. So that's almost total control and free agency and all that other stuff. Certainly he had uh, a voice and a very strong voice there. And that's where Harbaugh comes into the picture because, you know, it, it worked out so badly. And they get the lawsuits and everything else with the emails with John Gruden that they want to come back and, and, and say, Hey, Jim, we're giving you, because if a hardball is going to go somewhere, it's going to be with a lot of control and, and a lot of say when it comes down to personnel. And you know what? He's going to need a, a Gruden-type contract. Are the Raiders really going to go in there and say, hey, you know what? We, we just got out of a, a mess here. We're going to go on the same line here. We're going to go with a with a guy that uh, we're going to give him a, a – the fans are going to love it, just like they love Gruden. We're going to give him $100 million and we're going to give him pretty much uh, total control over this. Are they going to follow up? Because usually – Coaches uh, and franchises, they don't do that. You got a, uh, you know, uh, a short taskmaster. The next thing you know, you usually get a, a tall, skinny country club type guy. So, I, you know, just from that standpoint, uh, you know, you could say that, uh, you know, you could question whether or not the Raiders would be, you know, going after Jim Harbaugh. Yeah, you know, there's a relationship there. Jim co uh, coached there way back 20-some uh, years ago. And I think they know he's a high character guy. Jim has no dirt on his, uh, he, he's got nothing, no skeletons. He hasn't, they haven't come out this far. So I don't think you're going to read about any skeletons. Well, I don't know what it's you, skeletons, maybe about, you know, some emails or anything else. But, you know, one thing that could be a sticking point is that, you know, Jim Harbaugh went to three NFC championship games, you know, when the, the, the Packers. Yeah. We're, we're losing to the 49ers. You know, I keep seeing these uh, the replays of the, of the Niners beating the 
beating the Packers and, and doing it at Lambeau. You know, they keep showing Colin Kaepernick running into the end zone. I, I know who the coach of the, the 49er teams were there. He went to a Super Bowl and went to three straight NFC championship games. He should have gone to another Super Bowl if his if his uh, punt returner or kick returner Robinson, you know, didn't drop that that one punt. You know, you could easily make the uh, one play, one one kick. That uh, one fumble, one turnover there that he'd be going to uh, another Super Bowl. But, uh, you know, so he has that. But the part about the skeletons in the closet, you know, it's all out there in the open air. Like he has to have a lot of control. He didn't get along with the general manager or owner. And, you know, the players called him a taskmaster and all these other things. So, you know, there's a part about it. If you're going to the NFL, it's like, hey, you know, you're not bringing in. Nobody's going to be sitting around holding hands and, you know, patting everybody on the back. Harbaugh's coming in. And he's doing it his way. And, you know, you can like it. You can make the deal. And, you you know, you see how it could pay off. Look at his record. Look what he was able to do in the postseason. But, you know, this is not like, uh, hey, everybody's just, you know, thinks Jim Harbaugh, this is pro-wise, you know, thinks he's the greatest guy or the greatest coach and everybody wants to work for him. Yeah, I think, you know, Jim obviously had, uh, he had Balky, who's down with the the Jaguars. And I think Jim knows uh, he would, have a pretty good idea of what he would want in the in, in terms of the guy he would work with. That's right. You know, and he he has that uh, that you know that personality, uh, and he's thinking about if he was to make this decision. And, and we really don't know uh, what these other guys are uh, saying to him, what kind of a uh, power he would have, what kind of decision making he would have, but. Uh, no, I yeah. think we do know, Scar. I, I think he's going to have a lot, or he's not going to go anywhere because he yeah. can make his choice. I mean, he's not desperate. He's in a position of power, which is great. And I think the one thing here is like it's not really a criticism of uh, of Harbaugh. You know, if he goes in, you know, he's gonna uh, he's gonna ask for what he wants, and if he goes someplace, he's gonna get it. And you know, sure, you're a conduit through the fans and everything else. You're like you're the G, you know, even you know, you're the the CEO of the team and everything. And look, you know, Bill Belichick's a, a, a jerk and, you know, he comes and he treats people, you know, you know, not, he's not the nicest guy up there and everything else, uh, unless you're talking about something else non-team related. But if you win, you know, people respect you and you end up looking at like, you know, one of the greats of all time. So, you know, you, you win in the NFL, that takes care of anything. So, you know, coming in and, you know, you don't have to be a, you don't have to be the most per, uh, people person uh, out there. You know, when it comes to everything I just said about Harbaugh, you go yeah, with like, and- like Al, da- like Al Davis used to say, man. And I actually met Al Davis, shook his hand, just win, baby. So, you know, they don't care about whose feelings you hurt if you're winning. You know, well, I think the other thing with the Raiders to keep in mind, and and I don't know how much it's talked about. You know, people that uh, are sitting here and are just talking about the coaching carousel nonstop, <laughs> they've probably uh, considered it. But we've known now with all of the job vacancy, there's been a few coaches. You think of Flores down in Miami. You think of Tully there at Houston. I mean, those were coaches, and they're black coaches, and they got fired. And really, they were, uh, you know, questionable firings when you look at it. Now there's only one black coach, Mike Tomlin, in all the NFL. And the Raiders, when it came down, I mean, the Rooney rules for for Rooney, who for owns the Steelers. But if there was a if there was another franchise that's got a a, a good record when it comes down to uh, minority hirings, it would be Al Davis. And, you know, the word is that his son, Mark, is a chip off the old block, you know, from his old man there too. And you know what? Uh, These NFL teams should be uh, considering minority candidates, not just so that it always gets down to the Rooney rule, whether they're just doing it, you know, for appearance or anything else. But I think the Raiders uh, and, and all these teams, they should and they will, you know, take a hard look. You know, when it comes down to, um, you know, minority hires, that would be another thing. If you're just playing it out percentage wise, when it comes down to, you know, looking at, you know, the Raiders and, and what they might do. Uh, yeah. You know, he's got a relationship there, but these other things, there's, there's some other factors as well. And plus they just jumped that Gruden right off the bat. You know, this time they said that they're going to wait and they're going to, you know, play this one out, interview everyone. So if it is going to ra- be the Raiders, you know, don't think of any uh, quick resolution or anything. They have to do their diligence on all these coaches. Yeah, I tell you, one of the first guys I would call anywhere is Jim Caldwell. I just respected the hell out of him. He won here in Detroit. I mean, we can beat that story up, you know, Detroit Lions, but I'd like Jim Caldwell. That's a guy I would call. And when I was with the Raiders, Danny, I met Art Shell. He was the offensive line coach, highly respected, you know, a former player there. And then he went on to become, you know, 
the uh, first black coach in the NFL. I, I remember that. And I, I had, uh, you know, I had a, I had met him. So I saw him. I was happy to see that. Yeah. The Raiders have always been out front on, um, on any of that. And, and, and it gets back to Al just win baby. And he don't care who, he, who the leader is. He don't care what color he is. Just win. Right. Right. Good point. So and anything else you said, you think it might be done sooner than later here. I mean, that's your, uh, you know, you're talking with your, you know, your former teammates. That's what everybody. Yeah, says. you know, I, I well, the, the the guy I was talking to, because I said uh, last week that I thought we'd be done by Sunday, which is a couple of days past. So we're still dragging this thing on, but I just think it's all coming together. Uh, they they got to get some things, a uh, couple T's uh, and I's and dotted and you know all that kind of stuff. But I think we're coming close, and. Um, but it's going to be over and done, and, and we need to put it to bed because it, it doesn't help recruiting. You know, speaking of recruiting, Danny, real quick, you know, people are talking about Ohio State firing two really, really good coaches. They fired Kerry Combs, a guy who I've known a long time, who is a great recruiter and a real good coach. He, that guy was all over the country, really, really good recruiter. And they fired Al Washington, who was at Michigan who's also a really, really good recruiter. That's all good for Michigan, man. We're, and people aren't talking about it. I see it, and I like it. I like it. Firing coaches up in Columbus is all good for the Wolverines. Yeah, you like that chaos. You like that offseason chaos. And I'm going to say another thing, and I remember hearing Urban Meyer talk about this. Urban Meyer was smart, man. Their scheme defensively at Ohio State, they ran a 4-3, okay? And – the, the, Urban talked about changing it at times and this and that. He said, you know what? When I go to recruit a kid like Chase Young and he says, I want to play in the NFL and I want to rush off the edge, you know, I want to be the next, you know, great pass rusher. And those are the guys that get all the money in the NFL. Urban Meyer said, I'm going to run a 4-3 so I can recruit that kid and tell him he's going to make a lot of money. We're going to teach him how to play that position at Ohio State so he can make a lot of money, and all those things help in recruiting. But what's going on in Columbus now is they're going to run a three-man front, and people aren't talking about that. I see it. Urban Meyer talked about it. They're going to run a totally different scheme, okay, and it's it's a different deal. There's no edge, wide nine. People talk about if you know what the heck that is. I like seeing that because now all those little things affect recruiting. And uh, that's all good stuff. And I, I like seeing Michigan State continue to bring in all these transfers, too. I like it. I just saw where a, uh, a, a highly recruited linebacker is leaving. He's leaving. He was recruited by the Spartans, and now you're bringing in transfers. So he's leaving. That kind of stuff has to continue up there so it starts to affect recruiting. I, I've mentioned it many times. But, hey, man, I'm all about Michigan, so I want whatever's best for Michigan. I make no apologies there. Well, you know, you should. But, you know, what's happening down in Columbus and East Lansing, they're laughing when you say that. He's like, your coach is ready to, you know, hook up with the Raiders. You guys are going, you know, everything's – you talk about chaos. You better <laughs> keep your own house and not worry about your other ones. Yeah, you know, Jim Schwartz brought in that wide nine where the Lions didn't really work. But, you know, I get it. You know, it, it can, you know, if you, in, in principle when you start looking at it and, if you get a great uh, rush edge or whatever else, you know, when it comes down to, to Jim Harbaugh with me, if um, you know, this was the, the first uh, go around here, I would look at recruiting and I would say, Hey, you know what? I'll put February 2nd as a drop dead date. You know, he's got to have something resolved since then, or, you know, this is really going to cost or really could cost Michigan when it comes down to recruiting, but you only have to go back to last year when it was the same thing. He was out there, whether or not you think that he was throwing in his hat or trying to get an NFL job, I mean, that's up to anybody that's watching or listening right now. I happen to think that he was kicking the tires and hoping that uh, he was going to be able to get a job. And, you know, they didn't give him the time of day last year. And that's why I think now that, you know, he's, uh, you know, the cat's meow. And and it's in, in any job, wouldn't it be great? Like, you, you know, you, your fallback is like, you know, I've got everything that I ever wanted here. I got my family. I got all the power. I got all the money. I can name my price. Uh, everybody loves me. I can do everything. You know, just go back to Michigan, which, you know, I, and I can do that at any second. Or, you know what? Now I can go out there and let's just see what everybody has to say. You know, now that there's all of these coaching hires and I've been to a Super Bowl and NFC championship games, and I'm looking at some of these other guys' resumes. Let's go. Let's see what they have to say. 
That's what I think what's going on. Now, <laughs> where, you know, they, they want to get serious and, and, and interview and, and, and to make an offer, you know, that's when it gets into the danger zone. Uh, so we'll find out if that's going to happen here, uh, how close he gets to that. But, you know, I think he's uh, – uh, because he can. Because he can. And it didn't hurt last year. And, you know, what's it really going to hurt this year? So that's what I think. Yeah, we'll see how it plays out, Danny. Time will tell. But I'm, I'm thinking pretty soon we're going to get some good news. Well, uh, I think everybody hopes you're right about that. Certainly the Michigan fans, not these Spartan fans that are listening to you, Scar. They're like, hey, you know, Scar's dogging a, our four-star linebacker that took off. And, uh, you know, our, our – uh, But think about it, Danny. You, you don't think those transfers that came in, he brought in a kid from Nevada. He brought – I mean, I guarantee you that affected his decision. This kid, you know, this kid was recruited – to play linebacker, you know, he, he probably got kicked around as a freshman like we all do. And he's thinking, you know what? I might be the guy now. I'm going to be able to compete this spring. And here's this coach that recruited me, and he brought in these transfers. You know, I'm a little pissed off too, man. Maybe that's why he packed his bags. Well, Scar, I think everything matters. And, you know, last year when I looked at uh, Tucker when he was in there, you know, he, he only knew his recruits through Zoom. You know, he never met any of them. I, I think he went to practice and, you know, they had tape on their their helmets. He was looking like, who's this guy? You know, he hit the transfer portal, you know, for, uh, you know, half the team. But meanwhile, he was able to put together a, a, a pretty formidable squad. So that's a guy to me that knows how to put together a football team. I'm not one to go pat in Michigan State on the back or anything. But, if you know, if you're looking for – everything matters when it comes down to coaching and recruiting and everything else. But – you know, I'm also going to look at, you know, what has happened here uh, recently and, you know, what kind of uh, uh, what kind of product that they put out there. And, you know, Tucker's shown that he can throw together uh, Scott's tape up a pretty uh, a pretty good team with what is at his disposal right now. And what is at his disposal is that transfer portal. And, you know, you can make a case that he's got the Midas touch when it comes down to that. I don't know how sustainable that is, you know, hitting the portal left and right and throwing guys out there. but. It sure as hell worked last year for him. So, yeah, I mean, I'm sure I, I, I wouldn't want if it was uh, – if I was a Michigan State fan to see, you know, four-star linebackers hit the road. But, you know, it's, it, it was kind of like that in recruiting. You know, they didn't have the greatest – I mean, they, they did pretty well in recruiting, but they also went out there in the transfer portal and got guys that used to be four-stars and were able to bring them in. So, I, you know – I no, I, hey, listen, Danny, I give him credit. You know, he put it together. He put his pack, you know, he, he brought in uh, the good running back. And he, he listen, I give him credit for that. I just think there's a downside. And don't, and I'm not going to underestimate those good defensive linemen they had. There, there, there were guys that were four or five-year guys in that defensive line that have been around. Those were good players. Offensive line, those guys have been around. And the quarterback was a guy D'Antonio recruited. A lot of those guys he inherited. You know, a lot of really good players. Reed, you know, and um, – but uh, at the same time, that's, you know, they look, the guy can coach. We got to deal with him. And I'm just looking at, I'm looking at it from another side that, uh, you know, is, is uh, they just lost a good linebacker. So they, they got, they got to figure out, is that what they want to do? Take, take a long view of it. You know, you think they're going to be down next year? I mean, they had a fantastic year. I mean, you think Michigan State are, is a serious contender in the Big Ten East? Or do you think that, you know, hey, Michigan State, that was a, it was a one-year wonder type thing, uh, and, and you're expecting them to have four or five losses. What do you think? No, I think you, you have to deal with them, man. The quarterback's back. I got to look – you know, they're, like I said, they were really good defensive linemen that had been around there and some offensive linemen. He brought a kid in. They put a good offensive line together. Um, you know, the Reeds coming back, they're going to be a problem, man. You got to deal with them. They, we, Harbaugh hasn't beat them yet, so it is, it is what it is. But um, – well, he's beat him a couple times, but he has a losing record against him. So yeah, he hasn't beat Tucker though. He oh, hasn't Tucker, a good yeah. point. Yeah, you're you right. Know, he hasn't beat Tucker, no. and um, but yeah, they're they're going to be a good they're going to be a good football team. They got the quarterback back, but uh, I got to see how they fill in. How, and, but you know, they lost their D line coach too, and, and and that's been an, that's another thing, Danny. I look at all that stuff. That guy was a good coach. I thought he was good. He, he they brought him. Uh, D'Antonio got him, I think, from Air Force back in the day. And uh, he was with D'Antonio. He was a damn good defensive line coach. And, uh, and and even looking at what they did this past year, I just think he was a good coach. He was a good recruiter. And uh, they're making a change there. So what does that mean? I don't know. But I thought he was a good coach. So anytime a good coach leaves, you know, 
you know you know my thoughts. If they're for the enemy, that's good. That's good for Michigan. I hear you. And you mentioned recruiting there. Let's get to the Michigan recruiting spotlight. And uh, for that, you know, yesterday it was uh, the mark the two weeks until February the 2nd. So we're under two weeks now to National Signing Day. And I asked Brandon Justice of the Maize and Blue Review just where things stand right now. And you're looking at Josh Connerly and you're looking at Andrew Paul. Uh, Michigan's trying to close on those two guys. I mean, the situation with Kevontae Henry is one to keep tabs on, but – as we've said, that one does not look good for Michigan. Uh, and so you're looking at Connerly and you're looking at Paul. And There it is. Those three guys, to, you know, to keep in mind, bowling up, then there's always a, a chance for a surprise. But, but Connerly's an offensive tackle out of Seattle. All the other teams that he is uh, considering from Miami to Oregon to Washington to USC, they all have one thing in common. All of their coaches are new, you know, so – if, if Harbaugh makes an announcement, you think, hey, the stability, I have, uh, you know, I, I put myself like a 50% chance at landing the tackle. If he makes uh, a, an announcement on February 2nd, there was some uh, thought that maybe he would blow past February 2 because of the uncertainty and everything else, uh, you know, with the staff there. The other guy, the kid Paul, is not keeping his cards close to his vest, but, you know, Michigan was in on him pretty early. First, a big school along with Colorado was I give them like a 70% chance at Paul and Henry who's committed right now, but is going everywhere that he can, you know, to hey, Henry, what position is Henry defensive end, California. Okay. Yeah. So, so he's, so, uh, uh, and, uh, and Courtney Morgan were, you know, his connections there. And, and obviously both of those guys are, are, are gone and he's looking elsewhere. So I would put that as like a 20% chance, you know, so 70% for the running back. 50% for uh, Connerly Jr. Uh, for me, these are the numbers that I'm putting out uh, and just how I feel about it. And then uh, Henry, I'll still put Michigan in there with a chance, but you know, a pretty low chance, 20%. Yeah, uh, Connerly is the good tackle. He's got people, all, you know, he's looking at schools all over the country. You know, he, he's not afraid to go to Miami. So, or, or Michigan, those are a long way from home. Yes. Uh, I, I don't know. I don't know who's recruiting on which guy on our, on our staff. But uh, Sharon Moore is definitely has a uh, has a reputation now. They just won that award. That's got to help recruiting big time. Uh, so I don't know what the kid's thinking, man. Does he want to leave home? A lot of guys want to leave home. A lot of guys, you know, every kid is different. I, I, and I experienced this uh, with some of my players I coached. And, you know, people say, well, why don't he want – some kids want to get away from home. They want to get away. They got stuff they don't want to deal with. Other guys want to be near home, and it depends on the kid. And it's got nothing to do with the coach, with the coach or the, the college. Sometimes they're just they're going away. Uh, and the the running back is a three star kid from Texas, right? That's right. Yeah. So, you know, um, he, he's got to like what Michigan does with our running backs. And I, Michael Hart is, I, I think, the guy recruiting him there. And you, you can't ask for a better guy to recruit a running back in Michigan. There's there's no there's no there's no coach in the country. Than, than better coach than Michael Hart to recruit a running back to come to Michigan. Michael Hart's lived it. He knows what it is to play here. Uh, he's a good coach. He knows how to talk to those kids. So I think we got the right guy on that deal. And you never know. Maybe Mike Elston can uh, uh, pull some magic and get a relationship. I don't know who's the lead recruiter on the kid from California. But, you know, Jim Harbaugh, you know, he, he, co he coached at Stanford. He coached the 49ers. He coached at San Diego. Those were his three first stops. Jim Harbaugh's name in California is still big. It's still big with, uh, you know, with the parents and the grandpas and the uncles. Uh, they know who the hell Jim Harbaugh is, even though the guys that are coming out of high school, you know, they don't remember him so much when he was at Stanford and some of these places. But his name is big in California still. Yeah, and for me, I look at Paul. I know he's he's ranked by rivals as a three star, but uh, you know, I saw a quote from his coach saying, you know, they're he's getting the Bo Jackson treatment right now. You know, he had his, in October Texas State, Sam Houston, and Houston Baptist. Those were his offers, and then one of the the coaches from one of those schools was took the coach outside and said, hey, uh, you know, what do I need to know about this kid? I mean, I'm looking at his tape. You know, he's he's awesome. The coach is like, you know, you don't know anything. People aren't really looking at his tape. You know, he's just not getting the word out. And then Colorado, then Michigan, and now Clemson, and now Notre Dame. You know, they're they're all 
So I, I think that, you know, he might be uh, ranked as a three-star, but if I was a, a Michigan football fan, I would be looking at him as uh, as a four-star, I mean, if that makes any sense to uh, to the folks out there. So yeah, isn't, it, isn't it crazy how that recruiting works sometimes? It's like, yeah, you just you just wait and wait and wait. Like I got a buddy whose kid's out getting recruited. He's in New, New Jersey, and he's got some smaller offers. And, and, and you know, the guy, his co- high school coach told him the same thing. He said, once that big offer comes – then they're all going to come in. And that's just how it is. Everybody's waiting to see what, what do they know that I don't, what are they seeing? What, 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 what's the inside information that maybe I didn't see. And, and that's kind of what they're, uh, that's how that plays out sometimes. And, uh, but we'll see what happens with him, man. You know, we, we, we've got good running backs and looks like a kid that could play defense or, or running back. Yeah, I've always wondered, you know, it's all fun, you know, for, for fans and all of us, and, and especially if we haven't watched any of the guys play, you know, yeah, you can watch some some video and that stuff's, uh, you know, available. Heck, you can watch the kids, uh, you know, games on YouTube, so you can know a lot more than you could even five years ago. But I always wondered what the uh, the coaches' overall boards look like. I mean, are they sitting around thinking, you know what, yeah, nobody really likes this guy, but, man, we think this guy's the best. You know, and then vice versa, you know, the guys that they might say, oh, this guy's the best kid in the state. And I'm like, we don't, I don't want that kid. I don't even think he's that talented. Uh, I always wondered, you know, what. Hey, Jenny, uh, I, I, it's a uh, coaches battle it out, man. It's just, it's the same thing in college as it was in high. When I, I would get my coaching staff together, my high, my high school, you know, my JV coaches, my freshman coaches, my varsity, and we would look at kids and we would all have different opinions, man. They say, ah, oh, this kid's this, this kid should play here. And this, you know, as the head coach, I got to make the final decision, but. People will look at a kid and evaluate them differently. I seen it in, uh, you know, I remember a kid that was re- getting offers from Big Ten schools that we were coaching in, in Central Michigan. Didn't think he was good enough to play at Central Michigan. You know, I remember talking to that coach. I'm, you know, so everybody has different opinions about what they see, how that kid's going to develop, and uh, you know, if, if there was, and it's a hard thing to predict sometimes. But they're all different, and there's no shame in that. Because there's no there's no exact science. All right, let's take the turn here and get to Big Ten basketball. And if you're a fan of of Big Ten hoops, then uh, tonight we've got number four Purdue taking the trip to uh, Bloomington to take on Indiana, a team that Michigan will play a uh, three thirty on Sunday. So Purdue at Indiana tonight. That's seven o'clock on FS1. Not not a bad game to to take in if you're a college basketball fan. Oh yeah, that's a, that's a big rivalry there. That's their Michigan, Mich- our Michigan, Michigan State. Those teams hate each other. True. It really it really matters there. And uh, you know what I'm seeing, Denny, is I think any any and everybody is get, is beatable in the Big Ten. Yeah, Purdue is good. Yeah, Illinois is good. But um, you know, Michigan State is good. But they just lost at home. You know, so. I, you know, if you play your game, you know, getting back to our Wolverines, we're capable of beating anybody if we if we play uh, at, like we at, we're playing better defense. We're if we can make shots like we did at Nebraska, like we did this past weekend. The body's getting so much better, so much improvement daily, weekly from that kid. You know, we're we can compete with anybody. You know, I'm, I, I watched all these guys play at Ohio State. We can beat Michigan State. You know, we uh, so hey, they're all beatable. Let's just keep getting better. Yeah, well, you know, considering you know, you start looking at the standings, and I agree with you with all of that and what you're taking a look at. But you know, the the, the one that jumps out is the loss to Minnesota. I mean, Minnesota, they haven't done anything. You know, since they, they played really well against Michigan, they look great. Uh, your one-two combo. Oh man, they're awesome. Look at these guys. Uh, they didn't do anything before. They haven't done anything after. You know, so that loss uh, sticks out like a sore thumb. Uh, for Michigan, but yeah, I mean, you get you go out there and you know change things around in the view by winning on the road. It's hard for any Michigan team historically to go in there. The Bloomington, whoever the you know was on the rosters uh, and win there. I mean, that's a that's a tough place to play. So uh, yeah. Sunday will be uh, it will be interesting. Be interesting for you, Scar, because you've got uh, you know Tom Brady and the Bucs hosting uh, Matt Stafford and the Rams. That game will kick off a little bit after 3 o'clock. Michigan and Indiana, a 3.30 jump in Bloomington. So do you, do you have, you know, I, I picture you with a couple screens here and, you know, <laughs> one remote and you're able to take it all in or, I mean, how, 
What, what kind of uh, Denny, I, I, area do you have? Denny, I, I got the 75 inch, so I, I got oh. the I got the big screen, but I've got the uh, DVR. I am a DVR professional. So I will watch, you know, I just keep going back and forth. I won't miss a snap, and, and I'll watch the whole game. I'll watch them both uh, in its entirety. You know, timeouts, commercials, you go to the other game, you back and forth, and I'll be able to see it all. But, yeah, I'm, I am always rooting for Tom Brady. And, um, and yeah, you know, Michigan, yeah, it, it'll, be a, it'll be a tough game down there, but we can compete with them. We got uh, – you know, it's uh, it, that's a that that crowd is alive. They're close. They're right there, and it's a loud place. And the fans, uh, they they have great support there in Bloomington. The, the, the fans will be a big factor in that game. But I will definitely watch both. I won't miss anything. And I can't get over it. Seven. I have a a fifty five inch screen. I don't get to see it much because it's way up. I, I watch. Well, I think a fifty. But I also, you know, I was going into my uh my computer and it looked pretty good i'd had it all set up and then for the longest time i just had this little ipad over there and i'm like you know i wonder if i could get it and you know what i can i could get tv right there on my little ipad and it goes everywhere so the the I, i've seen setups that have screen and screen and everything it looks really nice uh, i wouldn't mind having one of those uh and, and 70 anything above 70 man it's a whole different experience when I mean, you sit back it's like being in a movie theater so I'm envious of that, but uh, I'll have basketball and football going. Yeah, you know, Danny, I, I like – I have a certain cable company for one reason, the DVR. I like their DVR above anybody else's. And I, I – because I, when I'm watching a game, I'm rewinding, I'm pausing, I'm slow mo. Because sometimes to really analyze, especially a football play, you know, you got to look at it two, three times to say, why did that play work? Why did it not work? What did this, you know, it, it's sometimes you, you just can't see it when it's run live. And if you don't have the chance to rewind it to really understand it. So, yeah, it's for me, I it's it's a must for me, man. I got to have that DVR. You know, my favorite thing is the, uh, what, what's it, about a five, six second rewind? You just hit that thing. Yeah. You have that there. You, oh, let me see that play again. Boom. And then, you know, you're, you're, you sound like John Madden. Boom. Then you're, you're building it up. And then, you know, you're like, all right, let me go back and watch that play again. Let me watch that one. It gets to the commercials. You hit live. Boom. You've erased the whole commercial set. You're ready to go. Yeah. That's the way I like doing it. Yeah, but every indeed. time I say that, I, you know, I won't have the game DVR because I'm like, hey, I'm watching it live or I hit pause. Next thing you know, I'm uh, hitting fast forward and, you know, I've missed a quarter there. So, you know, you always have to record and make sure you have your own back or you can end up, you know, outsmarting yourself when it comes down to some of that DVR stuff. If you haven't recorded it, you're just trying to be cute like me. Uh, uh, I, I've screwed up many times. Well, tomorrow, so we got um, Indiana hosting Purdue tonight. Uh, tomorrow night, 9 o'clock start, same FS1. You've got Michigan State. They're taking the trip to the most surprising team in, in a positive way in the Big Ten, Wisconsin. So we'll be able to see MSU whiskey uh, tomorrow night. I, that's, a, that's a must watch for your college. You, know, people, you, you say that. It's interesting you say that because I would say the same thing. It's like, you know, we're shocked about Wisconsin. Well, guess what? If Wisconsin didn't have the average year last year, Wisconsin has always been one of the toughest teams to beat for the last 15 years in the Big Ten. You know, Denny? But we're just we're, – we're basing it on what they did last year, which was a, a down year for them. But, yeah, they got they got good players, man. They always recruit – you know, they just play a methodical game, smart game. Seems like that Brad Davis has been there for about 10 years. They got a lot of guys that have been around. I, I think he has been there for six years, which, you know, is crazy, right? So, you know, what the thing is, like, Illinois, people are a little bit down on Illinois. They lost, uh, you know, DeSumo. They lost one of their other scores, and they brought that transfer into Utah. I mean, that guy's as good as anybody in the Big Ten. And Wisconsin, they weren't looked to be, you know, I, I know they do play a similar brand and everything, but nobody was talking about Johnny Davis, you know? Johnny Davis is the best player in the Big Ten. I mean, he can't be yeah. stopped. And, and nobody was saying, going into the season, people weren't sitting around saying, oh, boy, watch out for Johnny Davis. And that's all anybody says now. Yeah, he's so. uh, he's a good player. He's a heck of an athlete. Well, we saw him. He's a, I saw him last year. He played last year, right? Yeah. He was a freshman. And 
you know, he's really improved. And, and But they built a team around him. You know, they, they, they've got shooters. they got guys that can really stretch the floor. They, they've always had a big kid on a low block. He likes to play. Big white uh, kid, probably, yes. Yeah. yeah, you know, they'll, they'll have a kid that can step out and shoot the three at, the, at, at uh, their low post guys. But the, guy, they're, they're, the guy's a good coach, you know, and, he, and he, uh, he's got that kid surrounded with some good players. they got a good system. They don't turn the ball over. Wisconsin's tough. But – like I say, anybody anybody can beat anybody, and uh, you know there's there's no there's no real great team in the Big Ten. Purdue's pretty darn good, but uh, you know Michigan State got beat at home by Northwestern. I, who who would have saw that one coming? Yeah, I I did not see that one coming, but I I am, you know Michigan State. The, the refs in that game did everything at the end to to give Michigan State that game. I mean, two horrendous calls late in that game. The game before Michigan State had, you know, Hauser, the, the transfer who wasn't that productive last year, has been doing all right this year. You know, he ended up hitting the bucket at the end of the game. But I think it was Christie over in the corner. Total travel. I mean, they're standing there right in front of his, Izzo. I'm sure the guy was, you know, intimidated from Izzo. But, you know, they call it travel there. Michigan State loses that game, and they've lost two in a row. But, you know, they haven't, and they're up there, and they've turned things around. Michigan's got to win on Sunday. At least, you know, put something back to back together, or because then you're starting to look and you're like, okay, hey, you know, then they got Northwestern. They, they can, I know they Northwestern just won, but that should be a winnable game. And you know, then you're talking about stringing some victories together because you know some tough ones are coming up. Going yeah. to Michigan State, if they have to make those games up against Purdue and Michigan State, those aren't going to be easy. An opportunity, hopefully, they are able to play them. Yeah, hey, if they can beat Indiana on the road, that team's confidence will be. Uh... Out the out the roof, man. They can go anywhere and win. They'll, they'll be they will be a competent team, and they could win there. And Michigan State is a beatable team. I think Michigan could uh, match up and beat them. But the, you're right, Denny. We'll see what happens. But that would be a huge win that could set them up to have a real good run the rest of the season. You know, we don't know what kind of line we're going to have in, in that game, but if, you know, Indiana has to play tonight. You know, Indiana goes out there and beats Purdue. They'll probably be like a you know seven eight point favorite against Michigan. They get their teeth kicked in, maybe four or five. Is that how you see it? Yeah, I would put uh, I would put Indiana. I don't know. I don't know how how how, how what big a factor uh, the outcome for tonight would be on that line. Um, yeah, I don't I don't know how it would bigger, but I would say I would put that line uh, set uh, Saturday around uh, or uh, Sunday. I would put that line around. Uh, you know, four and a half, five, right about where you are. Okay. Yeah. Well, I mean, if you go out there and beat Purdue, he's only lost two games all year long. And Trace Jackson Davis goes for, you know, 30 and 15. You'd be like, whoa. Uh, let's see. So, I, you know, we'll, uh, it sounds like you're predicting a victory for Michigan on Sunday. I don't know. I don't know if I'm predicting a victory because that, I think that Jackson Davis, I mean, that kid is probably, he's probably the, he's nice. He, he might be the best big man in the Big Ten. I mean, this kid can step away. He's athletic. He blocks shots. You know, Hunter's good. He's not as athletic as this kid. This kid is a does a few more things. You know, I think. I what think about it, Kofi? I think this kid. This kid can make free throws. I think this kid. I, I'd rather go against Kofi. I think than this kid. Wow, that's saying something. All right. Uh, while we're on the predictions here, Scar, at the end, uh, I'm going to throw these uh, wild card. I, well, they're not wild card. They're divisional games. But it's a wild card for you because I said it, I, I didn't tell you it was going to happen. Let's hear some picks. Since he's at Tennessee, the um, the number one seed in the AFC, the Titans are a five and a half point favorite. How do you see that game? Wow, that went to five and a half. It was just three a while ago. Oh, I'm sorry. You know what? That's why I have these glasses up here. You are right. Three. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I'm, I like Mike Vrabel. I think he's a hell of a coach. Uh, Tennessee on grass at home. They've been resting their guys up, healed up. I would take uh, – I'd give the three. I would take Tennessee. All right. I'm thinking about taking Cincinnati straight up in that one. The um, Packers, that game's down to five and a half. It was six. San Francisco at Green Bay. How do you see that one? I tell you, I really like – I really think that one of the best coaches in the NFL schematically, offensively, that would get, that just gives you problems because – the scheme and the stuff they do is the San Francisco coach. He's one of the last guys I would want to defend. Uh, Mike Shanahan. Schematically. Okay, but the, Green Bay's got the guy called Aaron Rodgers. But I don't know how good Green Bay's defense is. I'm leaning, if someone pushed me, it pushed to shove, I would take 
I would take the points and I would take San Fran because I really like that coach. I like their quarterback. Uh, I, you know, and I think Green Bay's defense is average. I think they take, I think the points, that game could be a close game. They're getting, they're getting two pro bowlers back, uh, Jair Alexander and uh, Zadarius Smith. So those are two impact players on defense. I agree with everything that you had to say, except that you like the San Francisco quarterback. I, I don't like Jimmy G. Jimmy G is lucky that he didn't throw that game away to Dallas. He's lucky Dallas is Dallas or Mike McCarthy is Mike McCarthy because uh, if not, they might have uh, cut Jimmy G right now. But yeah. let's take it to Sunday. That's the Rams and, and Bucks. Uh, Tom Brady uh, against uh, Matt Stafford here. Now, if Matt Stafford can get this win, that'll really be a monkey off his back here. Tom Brady's done it a million times. He's got 100 guys out here, but we've seen him do it you know, so many times that it would be tough to, to bet against Tom Brady, but that's the way I'm leaning right now. What about you? Yeah, you know, they beat him out, out there in L.A. Uh, it was a pretty good game earlier in the year. Uh, the Rams Rams beat, uh, beat Tampa earlier in the year. I watched that game. Um, you know, Tampa Bay is is interesting. Are you going to get the team that couldn't score a point against the New Orleans Saints? Um, you know, or are we going to get the team that played last last week and, uh, you know, never got stopped? Or And so, um, you know, I, I this game, I'm, I'm going to go with Stafford because I think, you know, uh, Tampa still has a couple players out. They don't have the one receiver. You know, they got Evans. They got the tight ends. But, uh, you know, I saw that game the first time around. Uh, the Rams play real good defense. You know, it's tough to go against Tom Brady, but I'm going to take the points. I think it's going to be a real close game. And I, I like Stafford. I'm cheering for Stafford, too. I, I like both quarterbacks in this game. But I would take I would take the points with the Rams. I would, too. But you know what? I've seen it the 12 years when he was in Detroit. Just when you think things are going good and they've got all the players around you, Stafford will throw a game away. And a lot of times in these big games, he's <laughs> not going to make the mistake uh, to lose the game. Uh, but Matt Stafford, you know, has the propensity to do that. So, you know, that if it does end up going uh, the Bucks way, everybody said, well, we should have seen this one coming from miles away. But I'm with you. Uh, I feel like it, it is going to be the Rams because of the talent and the injuries on the other side. That gets us to uh, the big game of the weekend, the most enticing one. Uh, the Bills, they're on the road uh, at Arrowhead, the Sea of Red there, Kansas City. That is uh, the Chiefs right now, a point and a half. Which way are you leaning there? Yeah, that that line is uh, is pretty darn good, you know, because there's these teams, both of their quarterbacks, I don't want to defend because they're both good passers, but they the the biggest pain in the butt is that they're both mobile and they do they they do just enough to keep the play alive. They can avoid the rush. They got some predetermined runs with them occasionally. Uh, they're very similar quarterbacks. They can th throw accurate passes, and they're and they're you got to deal with their ability to run. Um, you know, both really good coaches. I think Buffalo might play a little better defense, but they're on the road. The, the, uh, the, that's, that's the one thing I think they're both good on offense. I think Buffalo plays a little better defense. The fact that they're in Kansas city, that's why it's one, one and a half. Um, you know what, man, I would just take, I, I would just take the home team. I would take the home team in this deal here. If I had to, if someone pushed me on it. Playing on grass, but that that'd be my pick. Well, uh, I was pushing you on it, so that is the selection. Uh, Scar, I want to ask if there's anything that you wrote down there that you wanted to tell everybody that's watching out there um, right now. You know, hey, it's as far as our Wolverine football team, it's it's really Ben Herbert time. This is Ben Herbert time. You, everybody talks about the strength coach. I, I, I th this is where the guy earns his money. This is where the team is starting to get formed and formulated uh, with that winter conditioning. I remember going through it and, um, and I know they're working, they're running and, uh, and lifting and getting strong and it's Ben Herbert time, but I got a memorable moment here at the end. If you, we'll, you finish oh, yeah. Memorabilia minute. Let's go, man. What do you got? Well, you know, Danny, it, it's actually, it's not, any any object or anything it's it's i want to talk about a guy that i played with because he, he just passed about a month ago all right guy by the name of milk carthens big tight end out of uh birmingham bloomfield hill area 
Uh, he, he was a year ahead of me, but he's uh, he, he was a good player. He was a, a tight end, caught caught a lot of passes, played a lot of football for the Wolverines, but he he just passed. But I, the, the, but I want to. He was loved. He, so many guys, we you know everybody has guys you love, and he was just loved by everybody. But you know, going through people have heard me talk. It's football is tough. The demands of college football is tough. You go to practice every day, and it's a grind. You go to school in the morning, it's a grind. And you come down, and you you know you you try to make it through. But big money, milk cartons. He was a guy that always had a a joke, a comment something to get you through the day, you know, but I saw a lot of my buddies uh, last week at the uh, wake that they had for Big Milt. It, it, we, we all just, uh, it was great to see a lot of my old teammates and he was loved. And uh, I just want to say a shout out to uh, a good Wolverine. He's up there in heaven. Number 83, baby, Milt Carthens. Well done, uh, Scar. Thanks for your time. And uh, we will talk with you soon. Enjoy your weekend. All right, Danny, talk. See ya.